Good morning, Pennington AG family, those of you who are with us, those of you watching online. Uh, we are into the dog days of summer. It is August. It is hot out. We are sending mission teams out. Um, we are joining together in community. And this morning as we look at Romans 12, we'll see a lot of what God is speaking to us about community and about how we live our life. But first, I just wanted to show, and as Brandon prayed over our mission team down in Mexico this week, and a few of you have asked, how are they doing? Can we throw that image up? They're doing great. There they are. Uh, One of the things I was reminded of, and even in my lifetime as a pastor, mission work has had this odd transformation where it's gone from this romantic idea of you go off into the wilderness, off into this land we've never heard of, and we hope to hear from you again, to like Gavin's texting me and sending me videos of the team, and it's like he never left. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, we have phones in our pockets and are still doing this thing. So we get to see in real time the team out there. If you're friends with them on social media, you can see them posting up some of the stuff of what God is doing and how he's working in our team in Mexico, as well as with Carolyn Martin, our missionary down there in Morelia, who is also a member of our church and was called to the mission field on a short-term mission trip herself. So it's awesome to see the work continue to move, God continue to work through the community and our community extended down there in Mexico for this week. So if you um, can add this to your time of devotions this week, be praying for our team as they are down there doing a VBS and working with the community down there in uh, Morelia. Gavin actually sent me a picture of himself in front of the wall that Carolyn stands in front of almost every time. She sends us an update and he's like, I'm in front of the wall. Carolyn's up update wall. And I was, at first, I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, okay. And then I was like, oh, oh, he's talking about the wall when she stands in front of, of the church that we have been helping to build down there in Morelia. So remember them and pray over them. Um, as we talk about community, it is a perfect tee up for Romans chapter 12. We've been walking through Paul's letter to the Roman church. And one of the things we've said over and over again is the letter to the Romans is a letter to real people living in the real world with Paul sharing really challenging corrections for their heart of community and how they live together as a people of faith. Different, diverse community brought together by Christ Jesus. And Paul is writing a letter. What has Christ done in our lives? How does that affect as we live in community. As we share on this passage, I'll be a little vulnerable, um, and little being the key word, in that I've had this shoulder issue uh, for a few months, but actually for a few years. I can remember actually the first time I had the issue. I played on the church softball team. I am just good enough that it's stressful for me because when I play, I actually make a difference, but I am not good enough that I can actually impact the direction of a game, so I'm right in that middle when I play. I normally play second base if and when I play, but this game, I needed to be in the outfield, which is fine, Um, but I remember catching a a ball, well, actually picking up a ball that was bounced out to me and then throwing as far as I could to try and make a play at second and felt something in my shoulder just go dead. I remember I was like, oh, I think I tore something in my shoulder. I was also like 31, so I was like, I'll figure it out. It'll be okay. That was like four years ago now. And over four years, it has come and gone. My shoulder's been stronger. It's been weaker. Um, The last few months, I've been playing racket sports more competitively. I have a partner that I play with, and I felt it even more. When I was on a trip in Turkey for school, I went to get out of a pool, and I went to push myself up, and I fell back into the pool. My right arm couldn't do it. And I was talking to my partner um, about it, and I was like, I don't know. i got to do something about my shoulder. And he said, look, you have two options. He's a, a tennis pro. And he said, Either it's really bad and something's messed up and you need to go get surgery. He's like, or maybe just practice some PT stuff and strengthen your shoulder. He's like, it's not complicated stuff and it'll get stronger quicker. He showed me the exercise I worked through. He's like, maybe you need to just stop doing nothing and either strengthen the part of your body that is broken right now or go get a real internal fix. But doing nothing about it is probably not the right option. So I started doing some PT stuff, and my shoulder feels a million times better. What Paul is telling us in Romans here about how we live our lives out, one of the images that Paul is famous for using about the community or about the church, about the family that Christ has brought together, is as a body. 
He says, you are a body, and each of you is a part of that body, and you're different parts of that body. But if one of you is broken, if one of you is hurting, if one of you is not functioning as you should be, it impacts the whole rest of the body. And as he starts out in Romans 12 here, we do not have an option to do nothing. He says, do something. Point yourself back to Christ, but get healthy in how we live out our call of Christ. Let's begin Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, we'll read together. We've been reading Romans. We'll be reading in the New Living Translation. There are Bibles under some of your chairs. You can grab it and read along. You can use your app. It'll also be behind me. As Paul says, Romans chapter 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Paul's pattern in nearly every one of his letters is to lay out theology Who is God? How do we understand God now through Christ Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection? How do we understand what he's done, who he is, how that impacts us as humans? And then the latter portion of his letter, as a good preacher does, he then gives practical application. Now, how do we live this out? How does this impact our daily life, our working life, our families, our communities? How does this impact it? As we're studying the book of Romans, chapter 12 is the pivot point of Romans. It is where Paul's now saying, I've laid out theology of God. I've laid out theology of how that has impacted who we are. Now, let's get practical and talk about how that impacts your life. What does that now look like to live out that theology? How do we influence and impact the world by light of what Christ has done? It's 11 chapters of doctrine. Christ resurrected, God's goodness, his plan for humanity and his expectations, humanity's inability to meet those expectations. So God himself putting on flesh, meeting the expectations himself, fulfilling the law himself, and then in our punishment of eternal death and sin, placing himself instead, being fully just of fulfilling it, being full of mercy and grace in fulfilling it himself, dying a sinner's death on a cross, and then on the third day, conquering death eternal, conquering sin and shame by resurrecting and then providing that resurrection to us, creating a new community of humanity who follows in the pattern and faith and grace of Christ Jesus. He spent 11 chapters arguing this, what this means, how this impacts us if we're Jewish, how it impacts us if we're not, how we draw together around that. Now he's talking about how we live that out. In the first few verses, famously, verses 1 and 2, he implores us to live your life as an expression of worship. Live your life out as worship. To this argument, we in service on Sunday mornings, we spend the first 20 to 30 minutes of service, maybe 40 if the Spirit really moves, but 20 to 30 minutes in song. Team leads us beautifully Um, Always great to have Frank and his beautiful voice leading us on a service. And we call that worship. And we use this language. We'll say, the worship part of service was great. And I'd say, well, then what was me preaching? What What part of service was that? What was us praying at the end of service? What was that? But even beyond that, Paul would say, That beginning portion of service is praise. We're giving glory to God. That beginning service portion of service is coming around the doctrine 
or the truth of what we believe and we're setting it to song and offering it back to God, of saying to God, God, this is who you are. This is how we understand ourselves in light of you. We are declaring that. We are offering that back to you. We are singing it out to you so that it is transforming us, so that it is bringing you glory, but that Paul would say when you leave this building at the end of service is when your spiritual act of worship begins. It is really easy to give 20 or 30 minutes in song. Well, for most of us, it is really easy to give 20 or 30 minutes in song. But the hard part is giving your life as an expression of worship. The decisions of how you work and how you spend your money and resources. Do you hoard or are you generous? How you treat other people when they hurt you, when they wound you. How do you respond to those people? the body that God has given you? How do you treat and honor him with it? Do you indulge in it? Let it live your life. Do you destroy it or do you honor him with it in discipline and in life and in joy? He says that is your spiritual act of worship. We can see it in three pieces because Jesus gives us this model in Mark chapter 12. Famously, they asked Jesus, well, okay, what what is worship then? What are the most important parts of the law? How do we do this? And Jesus says in Mark 12, verse 30, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is how you love God, what you do with the pieces of who I am that he's given me. How do we worship the Lord with our bodies? What decisions do we make about what we put into these bodies? What comes out of these bodies? How we use them for other people's care and love? What we do with our minds? What we fill our minds with? What we consume? How we process? How we use our critical thinking ability to make this world better? To share Jesus and to care for others? And what we do with our hearts, how we feel, how we express compassion and empathy and love towards others, what breaks our hearts, what we care about in this world. Paul says there are 11 chapters that teach you how to think, how to feel, how your body, it works, and what to use it for. Now, here are my practical steps of how to live that out. But before we do that, we want to make clear, and Paul makes clear here, I want to make clear, that living out a Christian life is not about grit and determination. It is not about coming out here and I need to feel more shame about the things I'm doing wrong and I need to try harder at the things Scripture says are important. No, you would have missed the whole first 11 chapters. Paul says you do this by sitting back under the person of Jesus Christ. We do this by entering into relationship with him. It is not our job to change our heart, to change our mind, to change our body. He says he has given us his very spirit, the Holy Spirit, whose job is to transform us and change us and make us more like Jesus. And so there are three practical tools that the church for 2,000 years has practiced to aid us in this transformation process. That is the word of God itself, the story of Jesus as revealed in scripture, the narrative of who God is, that we daily and regularly sit in the word of God and the story of who Christ Jesus is. We are reading Romans as a church that we can on our own come back into the story and read the text ourselves. We have more access to scripture than any people who have ever lived on earth ever have. We have it in our pockets. We have it on our computers. I have an entire list of commentaries 
on my phone in an app that I access. And a lot of the older ministers who are very loving and very generous will often say, I want to give you this commentary set. I want to give you these books. And I'm like, that is so kind and that is so generous. But I have that commentary set already on an app in my phone that I'm accessing while I'm waiting in line at the airport. I can do all of that right now. We have the ability to wrestle with the narrative story of God's goodness and grace at any moment of any day in our life. And he says the main part of how we change how we live is sitting in the story of Jesus, is reading our Bible, is studying the story of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation and sitting in that narrative. The second thing is spending time in the presence of God ourselves in silence and solitude quite possibly the most countercultural practice we can do as modern Christians is to turn our phone off, to disconnect from the constant role of media and be in silence and solitude and invite God to speak to us, to hear what he has to say. But then you might say, is it possible to study scripture all the time, to be in prayer all the time and to still not be living out the image of Christ? Is that possible? As a professional person who studies scripture and prays, and I'm around a lot of other people who professionally study scripture and pray, I will tell you this should not be shocking. Yes, it is possible to read your Bible all of the time, to pray a lot, and still not be a loving Christ-centered person. I know several people like this in my professional career. I am also on the internet and see the videos that everybody else shares about pastors or Christians or people misusing scripture, misusing the word of God. It's 100% possible. It is way too common. But the church has given us a third practice to correct this, and that is the community of fellow Christ followers. That is the guardrail for individual misinterpretation. That is the guardrail for me making God say the things I want him to say. That is the guardrail for me taking my own interpretation of life and how it should be, of politics and how they should be, of power and how that should be expressed and taking the Bible and taking my time with God and putting it all through the filter of that is the diversity of the community that Christ has put around me. Not just all of y'all, but every person who has ever lived following Christ Jesus. When I read Augustine, or when I read Luther, or when I read Bart, or when I read any of these saints who have written and wrestled with faith themselves, it is shaping me and correcting me and guiding me in the story of who Christ is and what he's done. To this end, Paul continues, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 13. How do we do this? What does this look like? Paul says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If it is as a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, Be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. I can meditate on this every day of how God has called us, how he has called us to live together, and the importance that, despite our Sunday morning schedule being centered around all of you or you watching, watching us on stage, that is not the church of Jesus Christ. I am gifted with teaching and leadership, and so I teach and I lead. But those gifts are not better than any of the other gifts that has made our church the beautiful community that it is. We all have gifts, and the church is all of us working together toward the same end of bringing Christ Christ glory and loving the community he has placed us in. Paul says this same imagery, this same 
bodily work, this community together of giftings, is a popular one that Paul likes to use. He even more clearly uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 15, he says this, Now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. We can't say, well, my gifts aren't as important as another person's gifts. I can't sing. I don't have patience with children. I don't have a great resting smile face, so I shouldn't be a greeter. I can't do these things, so I'm not as good as the other person near me. We can't say that. He says, don't say that. You have giftings uniquely in the way that God has made you that are necessary for the church to fulfill its mission of restoring people back to relationship with Jesus. Your gifts are just different. They may be in management. They may be in creativity. They may be in strength and, and physical aspects of who you are. They may be a total plurality of what ways God can gift us and work through us. To give you an illustration, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I grew up on them. They were very popular in the late 80s and the early 90s. I had all of the toys. I had the really cool sewer dwelling that I could move, and it had layers to it. I had their cool um, van that they traveled in. I had all of the action figures. When I would play with my dad, he always had to be the bad guy. And I distinctly remember him saying, why am I always Shredder? Why am I always Skeletor? And I'd be like, because I'm the hero. I played with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I watched all the movies. I was amazed. And it wasn't until my like early 30s that I really understood how they did those live action movies. I was like, what the, how are they actually moving like that? I am also grateful that the TV show I grew up with keeps resurgently coming back and it keeps dying and coming back and dying and coming back. I love it. This is from my era of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I say all of this not to talk about a show that I love, but that there are four distinct personalities in the turtles that make them effective. If you know their theme song, it lays it out for you of who they are, right? Leonardo in blue there, he is the leader, and he is serious, and he has the vision. He keeps them all on task. Michelangelo in the orange is a party dude. He loves to party, and he skateboards. He brings light, joy, and energy into the team. We need that. He's always the one that says, maybe we should order a pizza. They need that at the times when they do. Raphael in the red, he's cool but rude, and he brings that serious energy into them. He's the one you want to in the hard things, challenging it out. If he's an Enneagram, probably an Enneagram 8. He sees the things that need to change and he fights for them. And then you have in the purple Donatello, he does machines. That's the actual wording. He does machines. I don't know exactly what that means, but when you watch it, he's the techie guy that invents things and creates things. If you watch any show where there is a team, whether it's cartoon, fictional, whatever live action team there is, it is a dynamic of how good teams work. People have their roles and personalities that complement each other. We work in a diversity of how God has made us. Maybe it is an ooze that made you sentient and teenage forever, but it has also made us different and complementary to who we are. You can take the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles picture down. In every great team, there's a diversity of how we are made. This is the model of how God has made humanity from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, when he split one being into two, and he made them complementary dynamics, that you are different, and your differences make you better. They cause you to have to show love and grace to one another. When you may see the world differently, you may enjoy things differently. One of the greatest works of my own sanctification has been being married. And for Kate and I, we Sabbath differently. We do. I, I just want to go eat and I want to have fun. And she loves doing a project and a task. And we have had to work at both of us being made differently and how to love and Sabbath together differently. It has caused us to be more like Christ by learning to serve another person and show grace and mercy. Paul says this is the community that Christ has brought together. His death and his resurrection, his beauty and his glory has brought us together in diversity so that we make each other better so that we learn to show grace and mercy to one another and we learn to appreciate the gifts each other has. As Paul continues in 1 Corinthians, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. 
Let me say this as someone who stands on a stage and has certain prototypical giftings. You are indispensable. What you bring into the church is indispensable. How God has made you, how he has crafted you, the uniqueness of who you are is indispensable. You make us better. You make the kingdom of God better. There are gifts given into the community. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. Oftentimes, the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives are not new gifts. It's the gifts already in you, that God has put in you, the way you are made and shaped. He takes those gifts and he amplifies those gifts. He takes those gifts and he gives them a divine purpose. A purpose beyond maybe your nine to five where you're just chugging in and pushing buttons, writing code and wondering uh, what purpose is this job I'm doing. When we're called together as the church, he takes those giftings and he gives them a purpose that brings life into the world. That is redemptive and empowering and invites others into relationship with Jesus. Most of the time, the Holy Spirit is enhancing the gifts you already have. But the Holy Spirit may give you gifts that you've never experienced before. You may sleep and have dreams, prophetic dreams of what God is doing and sharing. You may begin to pray for other people. You've never done that before and you lay a hand on them and you feel like, well, maybe I have a word for you in this service, in this time. Or you may be serving somewhere and you may find yourself with more empathy and more patience than you ever have before. That's the Holy Spirit birthing new gifts out of you. How do I discover my gifts? This question gets asked in church all the time. There's not a clear black and white answer, but there are little tools that we use along the way. First one, if you are new to our church and you've never gone through growth track, it's our enter into the church process. It's also our help you see where you fit and where your giftings are in the church body process. We don't do them in August because it's August. But in September, growth track will be right back at the beginning of that month. And we ask you just after service, stick around. We'll feed you. And we will talk about what God is doing in our community, what he's doing in your life, and give you space to explore your giftings. The second is there are gift assessments. You can take a gift assessment and Growth Track will point you to one that you can use that we have used with some success that helps you point it out. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just live in a computer algorithm. And so the third way really is getting involved, moving, allowing God to use you, talking with another leader at the church, serving on a team, volunteering somewhere in the church, being discipled by another is where we see where our giftings are. Paul continues. Romans chapter 12, now in verse 14. Paul says, Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. And weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think that you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Revenge. Revenge is something we can kind of clearly say in the church community is not of Christ, right? A a savior who gave his life nonviolently, forgave those taking his life at the work of the cross then restored back his main disciple who betrayed him in an act of love and grace, seems to be a core character of God. He does not take revenge. Not to mention the Old Testament passages repeatedly where God is described as long of nostril or incredibly patient. Or in Exodus, when God reveals himself to Moses and says, I forgive to the thousandth. I practice justice to the third generation. So I am a God that 1,000 to three practices grace and mercy to where I practice justice and retribution. That is a clear character of God. Having said that, we also live in a community where revenge is glorified. Revenge is the standard. 
In one study I was going through of the Old Testament, one of the scholars said, Americans don't realize actually that our justice system is actually a rare system based on punitive punishment rather than restorative work. And when you read the Old Testament, when you read Deuteronomy, and when you read Leviticus and Numbers, the process for the Israelites was on restorative. Someone did something wrong. How do we make it right for the victim? What do they have to pay? How do they have to bring it back? Versus they've done something wrong and they must be punished and isolated and excluded. But we live with that as the common denominator. I'll give you a few examples in the modern age. When we talk about revenge, show in 2014, literally called Revenge. You may have watched it. It's about seven years old now. It was pretty popular for a very short window and then not popular at all. Revenge. Very popular. The next one, Revenge of the Sith. Blank of the Sith. Revenge, right? You turned her against me. You did this, Obi-Wan. High ground? Who needs it? You might lose your legs. Revenge. Then third and final, this is Very popular now, but most of you probably have no idea because you're not in this culture, but it's revenge makeup. I get broken up with, here's a video of me looking my absolute best. Or you might be more common with, when someone breaks up with you, what do you do? You go to the gym. You get your revenge body, right? Because you got to go back and make them regret what they lost. Here's a little tip. When you look at revenge makeup, it just seems to be dark lipstick. So if you just want to cut the the trend there, just dark lipstick. That seems to be what revenge makeup does. But all of these are common languages we don't even notice anymore that we have elevated getting even, taking our own, punishing those who have hurt us as positions of moral authority. You can hear it in how we talk about justice, that it is controversial to talk about forgiving somebody who has done something deeply wrong. Because if we forgive them, that we're, we're condoning it. If we forgive them, we are part of the problem. And I will say this, that to say nothing is always to side with the powerful. To say nothing is always to side with those that have and can manipulate and can use. So we must challenge and we must vocalize but there is a core aspect of what it means to be a follower of Jesus that believes in grace, mercy, and forgiveness. That I believe that whether or not I see justice done in the land of the living, I believe that there is a future time when the creator of all things will come back and will restore. And he, as Paul says, is the one with the authority to do justice. That he is the one who will come back and restore all those who have been taken advantage of and have been broken. And he is the one who will punish all of those who have done wrong to those who are vulnerable. Trusting that God is a God of grace. Paul says this earlier in Romans 5. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That the pattern of living as followers of Jesus, that all of what Paul's been talking about for 11 chapters, all of the theology, all of the doctrine, all of the exploration of Old Testament law and how God is working through the Israelites now and how we live it out, that is boiled down to this, that are we people now who live under a different understanding of life, that we can show grace and mercy and forgiveness to other human beings placed around us and trust that God is working a bigger, longer, and deeper work. That for the Israelites in the Old Testament to live for generations enslaved to another kingdom and to say, God, are you still good? Are you still just? And that when he calls a man named Moses, he says, I have heard, I am just, I will respond. 
that for another thousand years, a kingdom that God brought together, as they become the villains themselves and do all of the things God told them were wrong and take advantage of the powerless, offer their infants in sacrifice to other gods, take advantage sexually of others, abuse and enslave, that God says, I am patient, but I will practice my justice. We have the promise of Christ Jesus who is working a long game in every single one of us. Lest we forget in the land of the living that Christ has promised us eternal life, restoration of all things, and a new heaven and a new earth under his ruling authority. That the goodness of Christ is ultimately what wins. The beauty of mercy triumphing over death is ultimately what wins. And that Paul says, can we live as people who are practically and physically demonstrating that we believe that? That I believe if I forgive those who have hurt me and wounded me, that if I give generously and graciously to others that don't deserve it, I am practicing what Christ Jesus has done for me. That even though I didn't know him, even though I was in rebellion from him, even though I was hurting and making this world in my own image, he gave his life for me so that I could have life eternal. Can I live that life? How then can we hold resentment for another? So Paul asks, how can we? How can I hold a wound over another person as Christ holds nothing over me? How can I hold someone out of community of Christ? How can I hold them at arm's length when Christ welcomes me in? How can I change my own heart? Paul's answer is the previous 11 chapters, more of Jesus more of the story of who he was and is, more of time spent in his presence. Living in community with others is really hard. Living in community with 8 billion people across the whole globe of different cultures and mindsets is really hard. I am in a Facebook group of 5,000 AG ministers, but it's all of us across the whole country, West Coast, East Coast, center part of America. It's really hard. And God calls us, Paul's advice for us is every time living a grace and mercy relationship in community is hard, he said, just come back to me. Come back to me and remind yourself of what I've done. Remind yourself of who I am. Remind yourself of my story and my character. Then go back into loving each other again. And when we feel our tank of love and mercy and grace running out, it's time to go back into the presence of Jesus. It's time to go back into the word. It's time to go back into silence and solitude. And he has given us a community of one another to lovingly point out to each other when that time has come. Hey, you're not acting as the person I know you to be or as I know Christ has called you. We need to go into prayer. Hey, you're not acting out of this love and grace. What has your personal devotional life been like? Where is Christ speaking to you? to call each other back into that story. As we close out, I'll invite you, if you are new with us this morning, to just offer up a prayer of loving Jesus, offer up a prayer of entering into relationship with him. And then we're gonna open the altar space. The worship team will lead us in one final song. And for this Sunday, low key, I'll be up here. My wife, Caitlin, will be up here. We would love to just pray over you if you wanna be a more loving person, if you want to enter into this relationship with Jesus more fully, more deeply, if you wanna see the gifts of God used in your life, we would love to just pray a blessing over you and pray that God is moving and working in your life. If you'll stand with me this morning. Let's join together in offering just a prayer to Christ Jesus with eyes closed and heads bowed. Jesus, this morning, we thank you for the example you have set for us of someone who lived a life of generosity, love, and grace. 
and the transformation you offer us by your work on the cross and your work in the resurrection, that you have forgiven us, that you have shown us grace and mercy, and you have given us a way to eternal life by trusting in you. Jesus, we believe you are God and humanity in one flesh. You lived a perfect life. You fulfilled all of the law. And then you died in our place on the cross, fulfilling the justice of sin being punished. You bore that on yourself. And on the third day, you conquered sin and death, resurrecting. You offer us your presence, your power, and your spirit. Jesus, may we give our lives to follow you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time this morning, we would love to just continue that work. Pray with you. Celebrate with you. Just come up and talk to us and we'd love to pray it through. If you are a part of the church body and you just want to seek your gifts or you want to be made more in the image of Jesus, the altar space is open here. We would also love to just pray a blessing over you this morning as the team leads in one final song.